Great. So I'm a cybersecurity expert, as I go by these days, a marketing title. Um, I've over two decades experience in the world of cybersecurity. So what I want to do in these short few minutes we have are talk about some of the privacy aspects of cybersecurity. I represent an organization called the ICTTF, which is the International Cyber Threat Task Force. And anybody who's aware of anything to do with cyber crime or those elements will quickly realize that the bad guys work as a network. So we formed a network so the good guys could work together. And with over two and a half thousand members from over 100 countries being very successful, successful in helping deal with all types of cyber threats. So feel free, it is a social network, not quite as big or as valuable as Facebook yet, but feel free to join that and learn more about privacy and cyber threats in your own good time. Um, so let's look at privacy. Well, as humans, we're social creatures, and goes back to the days of the watering hole where we used to sit around as cave men and cave women. We like to chat, we like to, to uh, convey and communicate with each other. Uh, the bottom line is we have a human right under the Human Rights Act to be left alone. And this goes back to any uh, cases going back to the 1800s within the USA who, uh, and uh, across Europe in the world, which would fundamentally support that right that we have, the right to be left alone. And that, that is actually an abbreviation from a tort of law in, in the States where it fundamentally comes down to that. So we have a right to be left alone and our information not to be shared or to be contacted if we don't want to be. So what about social media? I am a particular fan of social media. Um, I use it a lot, think it's very effective, but it does come with a certain amount of, of risks and challenges. Challenges is a metaphor for you know, something else, complete pain and whatever. So cyber threats are social, and for most people we think of the main sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, those sort of things. But fundamentally, there's actually thousands and thousands of social network sites out there. So it doesn't matter whatever your, your, your buzz is, whether it's collecting budgery cars, whether it's fast cars, whatever it happens to be, there is a social network site for you, and there's, there's quite a few of those. But if we look at the big boys and the one that are in the media at the moment, Facebook. Facebook has over 900 million users, 300 million photos a day are uploaded onto Facebook. Uh, it's in 70 languages, installation of 30 million applications a day. I can tell you not all of those are um, uh, bona fide applications. A lot of them are crimeware and want to steal your information, sell it. Your information has a value. Information about you, how you behave, what you do, all has an intrinsic value. Uh, 500 million mobile users, that statistic jumps hugely. I know we've talked about Facebook maybe not having their act together yet on the mobile market uh, earlier on, but really that, that figure is just going up exponentially because I know that because I have to update this slide every time I use it. But the bottom line is criminals go where people go. And if we look at Facebook, it's essentially the third biggest country in the world. And that's where criminals will hang out. That's where they try and recruit other people to become part of cyber crimes. They will sell their crimeware and sell their tools, and they will try and defraud you and scam you within sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. Because that's where people socialize now, and that's what they want to use. So that's how they're going to use it. Um, something about cookies. We're probably all familiar at, at, at this stage with what exactly cookies are. But there's, um, I'm sure Billy can answer a lot of these questions later on about the new cookie rule in relation to data protection. A lot of people are, go, oh, well, cookies are bad. They're tracking what I do. And if I was to ask this audience, um, who who wants to be tracked online? Who wants people to know what they're doing? Probably 80, 90% of you will say, oh, no, we don't want that. That's a bad thing. If I ask the same audience, who wants to, when they visit a website, get the appropriate content delivered to them, for the site to remember what page they've just visited, and so on, and have the right information put back to them, they'll go, well, yeah, that's exactly the website I want. So cookies are actually a good thing, and there's been some recent changes within the cookie rule and data protection, especially in relation to smartphones and the obligations upon people who use cookies, in other words, anybody with a website, and what they need to do to stay legal. And as Billy talked about earlier on, some of the fines that are coming down are eye-watering in relation to what businesses will see, because they really are going to be substantial uh, powers in relation to that side. So it is all very smart, because it's all about smartphones these days. This is the biggest risk we're seeing in 2012 around cyber threats, is social media, social networks, and smartphone technology. Um, it, it's quite easy how, if you look at something, say, for example, like Angry Birds. If Angry Birds works on an iPhone, it will send maybe 600, 650 requests to the network an hour. If it's working on an Android, it'll be two and a half thousand requests. Why? Because it's taking down advertisements and it's chewing your, your data service and your bandwidth and it's getting paid. But more uh, uh, nefarious than that, if you like, or, or more dangerous than that, is the types of apps that are free out there uh, and people download. And some of them arrange, as, for example, certain demographs, and this is one particular one that we've come across, which was uh, being used to sell location details of children to paedophiles. And it was for sale. A lot of these are within games and so on. They're trying to, so, you, so as a paedophile, the paedophile was able to go in and say, I would like a Caucasian child between the age of 10 and 13. Very uncomfortable subject, but that's what happens. And so they had the geolocation data uh, of the children and so on within that. We're seeing a lot of stuff around, you know, a question I often get asked, but why would people want my data? What, what valuable is my phone number? What valuable is my email address? Every single little piece of PII, personally identified 
level information has a value to bad guys. If I get your mobile phone, I can use your mobile phone to text from your phone to somebody else without you knowing it, without compromising your phone but compromising the network. Uh, contact your, your address book and say, listen, I need you to click on this, wait and you see this. There's an implicit trust there, they'll click on it and they'll either get a drive-by infection or they'll be stung for some money or a dial-back number. And so SMS fraud is massive at the moment. By the way, one, one thing I'd say is that one of the leaders in this, very proud to say, is an Irish company, Adaptive Mobile, uh, which are leading the way on this. And uh, some of their statistics are here, for example, from Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And we see that Twitter, 35% of the, uh, the, the traffic was causing virus downloads that was coming out on that. So that's shocking Like when, when you think of where the control should be on that side of things. Um, we see lots and more, more stats about the different vectors of threat across malware on smartphones. Um, people are forgetting. Smartphones are computers. We're carrying them with us. We're tweeting one thing, then we're doing our online banking. We're sharing our data all over the place. So the challenges and opportunities. Well, first of all, I think that there's certain players need to step up to the plate and actually handle some of this. For example, the telcos and providers. But they need to get support within the chain of people being able to, because the internet is about collaboration. It's about people have, have as free as possible access to that. And we don't want to be uh, filtering, monitoring, spying on people, because I personally think, even though I'm the cybersecurity guy, I think that's actually not the way to go. We see some, some developments within HTML5 and the semantic web and linked data uh, from the W3C uh, consortium. This is exciting stuff. This is being able to run machines within machines within. So things like Flash may be going to the side. HTML has opened up a whole new world. This, the scary part of this, as you like, is the linked data project, and Google that and have, have some research on it. The linked data project may ma make it feasible, for example, for insurance companies in the future to know that you were researching maybe a cancer or a particular illness or whatever because of what you, the, the trace you've left uh, on the web. It may be able to look back 10 years, 15 years onto what you did on your social media site and what you posted. That's scary. So we need to address and look at all of those sort of things and say, well, is that fair? Or, or should we be doing it? But then again, is it fair to know what sort of illnesses are out there and use that as research? So anonymizing data is a massive challenge. And it's not an easy thing to do. And we've seen that from cases with Facebook, with Google, and lots of other large players who have published data and say it's all anonymized. Okay, and very soon, by correlating a couple of bits of information, you're able to retrace and reverse engineer who certain people are. So that's a massive challenge in itself. So I think it's all going to be about fair rules and licenses on data exchange. Um, and I think we need to face this challenge and embrace the opportunity that that brings along as well in relation to this space for privacy. Because the internet is only at its starting point. I know a lot of people say that, but I, I, the, the fortune to me, Tim Berners-Lee yesterday, uh, who founded and invented the World Wide Web, and we were discussing this, and it really is in its infancy from where these people and the vision they have on that. And he referred to the internet as humanity connected by technology, but he also saw it as, as a benign monster. And my thoughts were that we hope that you don't have to become a monster to be able to defeat that monster where we have to be able to filter, spy, control uh, people online, and it should be a, a free access for people and be able to uh, collaborate. So thank you.